Namam Vishnu Padaya Krishna Stai Bhutali Shimadi Bhakti Vedanta Swami Dhanamani Namaste Sarasuti Devi Gauravani Bhajani Nirvisesha Sanyavari Vaskichada Sadharani. They asked Prabhupada about this picture. They said, Prabhupada, you look so serious. Prabhupada said, Serious? I was in ecstasy. And this is the little bro brochure that Srila Prabhupada came with. It says, India's message, Srimad Bhagavatam. India's message of peace and goodwill. So Prabhupada came with this little, that was his mission, peace and goodwill. Next. So we should consider, what did Prabhupada leave? You know, to get on that boat and to come all the way across America, you know the story. But what did he leave? Where was Prabhupada? What did he leave? So this is a picture of Vrindavan 1972. This is the old Parikram path. Vrindavan had all kinds of trees and peacocks everywhere. You'd wake up in the morning at MVT and there'd be about 20 to 30 peacocks on the roof. They've cut down all the trees, the peacocks have nowhere to live and the monkeys are killing them all. But this was the Vrindavan that Prabhupada was in. And you would hear, you could not get a taxi, or you could not get a rickshaw walla. There were no motor scooters in those days or electric scooters. You couldn't get it out to our Krishna Balaram Mandir because it was so remote. There was nothing out there that they couldn't get a fare back. So they didn't want to pedal you out there um, and then have to pedal all the way back. So you have to pay them out and back, double fare, to get out to our Krishna Balaram temple at the beginning. So next. And you could hear off in the distance, especially at night, You'd hear, there's no radios, there were no television, you'd hear any of that stuff. You'd hear different bhajans going on to different ashrams. There'd be a little light, way, but there'd be a bunch of beautiful trees and an old, you know, crumbling ashram, and there'd be some bhajan coming out, you know, some old Babaji's. Or... So this is again the Parikram path, what it used to look like. That's Madan Mohan temple, of course. And this is where Prabhupada was living. Next. This is the transcendental skyline. You see the skyline of New York or the sky. This is the transcendental skyline of Vrindavan. That's the Jamuna River. This is looking from Madan. The top is looking from across the Jamuna, looking back at Vrindavan. And this one, the one on the bottom is from Madan Mohan Mandir, Sanatana Goswami's temple looking down. And this Jamuna River, 1973, it was crystal clear. You could say Gayatri, stand in the, in, the, in, the, in the Jamuna up to your waist, saying Gayatri, and you could see fish and turtles going by the crystal. You drank it. It was crystal clear water. Now it's, you know, all those things are, as Kali progresses, all the tirtas are disappearing. Next. So this is, again, this is looking at Keshi God. This is where, where at the Vamsi Gopal Temple, you could look out from the roof there where Prabhupada was first staying, and you could just see the whole skyline of Vrindavan. You could see the Jamuna. This is what Prabhupada left to come. Prabhupada, when he arrived in New York City, anyone know Prabhupada's first observation? The Big Apple? Smelled like dog stool. Prabhupada was not impressed, you know. Prabhupada, see the, he said, they're living in a pigeonhole of a skyscraper building. And this is what Prabhupada left. Next. This is, of course, this is uh, Kusum Sarovara. This is where Narada Muni observed the Ras Lila. Next. This is Radhakun, the apex of spiritual life. You can just feel the vibration of these places. Next. This is Govardhan Hill. Prabhupada was visiting. This is the world Prabhupada was living in, blissful Vrindavan. Do you hear those early tapes, 1966, 65, 66, Prabhupada's in New York? And Prabhupada say, oh, how I am missing my Vrindavan. And he says it with such depth and emotion. Next. He was staying at the Radhadamadar temple. These are Jiva Goswami's Radhadamadar. Next. And Prabhupada, although he was there, he was exercised by something. Like there's a rock in your shoe, you can't really walk. Although Prabhupada was in the highest ecstasy, absorbed in Srimad Bhagavatam, had the personal darshan of Rupa Goswami. I think we get to that. But there was something that was always agitating his mind. Anyone know what it was? It was the order of his spiritual master, go to the West, save these people, give them Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's message. 
So this is Prabhupada taking his prasadam. And if you go to Prabhupada's quarters there, rooms, in Brindava, in um, the Radhadamadar temple, you can look out that window and you see it's Rupa Goswami's Bhajan Kutir and Rupa Goswami's Samadhi. And Prabhupada was just meditating on it. How, please give me your mercy that I can execute this order of my uh, spiritual master. Next. This is the, when Prabhupada looks out, this is what he saw, Rupa Goswami's Bhajan Kutir. The window is up there in the corner. Next. And he was told by his spiritual master, Bhaktisiddhanta, you saw Radhakund, so Prabhupada's walking on that crossing between the uh, Radhakund and Shamakund. His spiritual master told him, if you ever get money, print books. If you ever get money, print books. And he had a recurring dreams. Prabhupada said, after his spiritual master told him to go to the West, he, Prabhupada told him that when he first, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta told Prabhupada that when he was a young man, when he first met Prabhupada, uh, when he first met Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, his spiritual master, his spiritual master said, go to the West. A fortnight before Srila Bhakti said, the fortnight is two weeks, right? Yep. Before Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur left this world, Prabhupada wrote to him, do you have any personal service for me? Prabhupada preach in the English, go to the West. Confirmed, like bookends, first time and last time. And then Prabhupada said he had dreams. He would be, he'd be sleeping at night, and in his dream, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur didn't speak to him, but would wake him up. I heard Prabhupada narrate this several times. He would, Prabhupada would, in his dream, Prabhupada would wake up, and Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur would walk to the door of the bedroom, turn, say, follow me, follow me. So in his dream, Prabhupada would follow him. And then when they got to the door, it opened into a courtyard. You know, anyway, there was a courtyard. And Srila Bhakti Siddhanta would cross the courtyard and come to the gate and turn to Prabhupada and beckon him, follow me, follow me. And you know how dreams kind of can fit together in different ways? When you got to the gate of the courtyard and you opened the door, there was the ocean, the, the Atlantic Ocean. And Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati in, his, in the dream was walking across the Atlantic Ocean and turning to him, come. Follow me, follow me. And Prabhupada said, in this way, he gave me no peace. So there's Prabhupada. He knew what his spiritual master wanted him to do, but how to do it? Next. So Prabhupada describes it how he would at Gopal Chan Goswami, who's passed away, he was one of the Goswamis in charge of the Radhadamrita temple. He was a young boy. There's a whole lot of far up pastimes with him and Prabhupada. We don't have time to tell. But he said that he, would, he was a young boy, and they're all sleeping there. And at night, late at night, he would sometime hear someone crying. And he would, you know, a little boy, he'd look out his window, and there would be Prabhupada sweeping in front of Srila Rupa Goswami's Samadhi, sweeping and crying and praying, calling, Oh, Goswami Maharaj, please help me. That's a murti of Rupa Goswami. Next. So Gopal Chan Goswami goes on to tell that Prabhupada, caught, Prabhupada didn't miss a thing. Prabhupada was the original Sherlock Holmes. I mean, Prabhupada didn't, I tell you, you try to sneak something past Prabhupada, was like trying to get dawn past a rooster. It just it never happened. Someday remind me, I'll tell some stories about that. So Prabhupada caught Gopal Chand as a small boy stealing out of the hundi right in front of Radha Namadar. Well, Prabhupada said, you know, said, this is not good for you. You know, you're stealing from the deity. Krishna has two eyes, the sun and the moon. He sees everything. This is not good. You shouldn't do this. I said, why? Asked him, why? you know, ask why. Why do you do it? The boy said, I love sweets. I steal the money. I go to Loi Bazaar and I buy sweets. This is a Prabhupada's heart. Prabhupada said, if I make you sweets, will you stop stealing? The boy said, definitely. Why? So we probably used to make him all, you know, make the probably was a fantastic cook. I don't know what particular sweets. He did mention para. He probably, you know, cooked in the Paris, made nicely. Brindavan para is fantastic. So Prabhupada would make him sweets. So they became friends, you know. And when Prabhupada was an old man, you know, elderly, and um, although full of life, um, Gopal Chan's mother would send him over to Prabhupada's rooms and say, you know, at night, oh, Swamiji, I'm cooking for my family. Do you want any rice? Do you want any sabji? Do you want any puris? You know, she would make, she, you know, it's Mataji, you know, genuine Vaishnava sentiment. You know, it's old sadhu. Can I help him? 
So Gopal Chand came over one evening and Prabhupada was cold. He was all, as they say in Australia, rugged up, you know, hat, scarf, sweater like that, you know, big hacking cough. Prabhupada was cold in Vrindavan. He's sick. So the uh, little boy asked, you know, Swamiji, you want anything? Prabhupada said, no, no, no. Middle of the night, they lock up those temples like a drum. If you ever, you know, Radha Raman, Radha Damana, Radha Gopinath, you know, Radha Shama Sundar, there, at night, those, you think of those wood doors, boom, nobody's getting in. Middle of the night, Prabhupada's talking to someone because Gopal Chand's parents woke up and they're looking, who was he talking to? They could, across the courtyard, they could see, Gopal Chand describes Goswami, an effulgent light coming out under the crack under the door, and Prabhupada was talking to someone with a deep, rich voice. So the next morning, soon as daylight broke, the little boy scampered across, see his friend, Prabhupada. He said Prabhupada was sitting up completely straight, chanting Japa, no cough, no cold, nothing, completely gone. And the little boy says, Swamiji, who are you talking to last night? Prabhupada said, I had the darshan of Rupa Goswami. Little boy asked, typical little boy, what did he say? What did he say? You know, he said, he told me, you go to the West, you write these books and go to the West. We will take care of everything else. So this is that darshan and Prabhupada described. You write these books, you go to the West, we'll take care of everything else. Next. So the original first canto, this is the Delhi version. Um, Prabhupada, I heard Prabhupada say this. I didn't know if I would be able to finish everything. So I put everything you need to know in these three volumes, like Krishna's full, fuller and fullest. So it doesn't mean we, oh, we just read the first canto. It doesn't mean that at all. But Prabhupada didn't know if he'd ever get chance to, you know, sit down and he thought he might die on the boat. So Prabhupada said, I put everything you need to know in the first canto. Next. Uh, and, and Prabhupada writes in the introduction, it's meant for nothing less than this meant to bring about a revolution in the impious life of a misdirected civilization. I can speak as someone suffering, a misdirected citizen in the age of Kali, cause a revolution in my, everybody sitting in this room. You read Bhagavatam, revolution within the heart. On the, I remember being so impressed. I read the cover, if you read the, the dust jacket, is it, I don't know if it's, too, anyway, when you read the dust jacket of the original Bhagavatam, before I even read the book, I read the dust jacket. I was, I was trying to figure out what is this picture? Entire existence, the entire existential existence of the self, its cause of suffering and its relief of suffering, the existential essence of every literary work, all the angst, you know, the whole thing is there. Greek tragedy, Shakespeare, they're all aiming at the same answers and the same questions and same answers. If there's actually solid literature on the dust jacket, the whole thing is explained. What is the position of the, I don't, I'm not going to go through it. You just read, but, but where are we? Why are we suffering? Where should we be? What is, everything's explained. I said, I've just read the dust jacket and every question I've had has been answered. Wow. What's in the rest of the book. Okay. Next. So this is Prabhupada sitting at Chippewata Temple in Old Delhi. This is where actually Prabhupada did much of his translation work. He would translate in Vrindavan, and then he would go up and he would also translate in Delhi, because in Delhi he could he could watch the, you know, monitor the see what do they call what do they, what do they, what do they call those things? The galley presses? Is that what they call it? Huh? When you, when you print the first sheet and then you check for it, because it was all um there was no it was all that, what do you call that? When it's just you lay the you typeset, you have to lay out all the letters. Yeah, yeah it was all done by that. And it, was, and it was in English, it was full of mistakes. So Prabhupada was always checking it for mistakes. So here's Prabhupada and he's reading the Bhagavatam right in front of him. Next. So this is Prabhupada's room, Chippewada. You see this, I don't have my laser pointer. Well, there, so be it. You see on the floor, this grating. It went down three stories and Prabhupada, and there was a lot of householders and he could hear them all fighting. Prabhupada mentions it in the Bhagavatam, arguing with each other. And here is Prabhupada in his little quarters. Next. This is, um, this is the confirmation of the ticket of Prabhupada's ticket on the Jala Dutta. And if you, I don't know if you can see, but it, here it lists the address. 2439 or whatever, Chippewada, 
So there it is. Next. This is now this temple is in Iskon's hands. Gopal Krishnamaraj Kijai. So it's actually an Iskon temple, and we renovated the whole thing. So that's the temple room, and then it just goes up an open ceiling. It goes up two more floors and then a roof, and Prabhupada's quarters were up there. So next. This is a close-up of the deities. These are the deities. Prabhupada was going every day for RT, offering prayers. Radha Balaba. Next. This is a, this is a recent picture of uh, Chippewada. It's, a, it's, a, it's right off Chandichok. It's an old Delhi. Old Delhi is chaos in and of itself. Chandichok, it, hey, right, who knows, it is chaos to the max. It's so tightly packed, you can't get a car or anything. And then off of Chandi Choke is Chippewada, and Chippewada, this is where all the printing, and there's the, the, that's the original press, that's Sharma Press, where the Bhagavatam was, and Prabhupada would sit there and look at the galley proofs and make sure everything was spelled properly, or at least improved. Next. So before Prabhupada departed, he went to Shantipur, that's the place of Advaita Charya, and he prayed fervently, please, the Lord Nityananda and Lord Chaitanya used to meet at Shantipur and strategize how to spread the Krishna consciousness movement, Lord Chaitanya's mission. So Prabhupada went to that place because that's where the, the vortex of spreading the Sankirtan movement, it's one of the places that it started. So he would go there, Prabhupada went there, I'm going to the West, I'm your agent, I'm your agent going to the West, please bless me, please help me. So the, it's about 10 years ago, maybe 20 years ago, the Pujari, not just the Pujari, he's the Mahant, you know, his family has overseen the place, the Shantipur, Advaita Charya's home for generations. He came to uh, Mayapur, Jayapadaka Maharaj tells the story, and many people heard him, he made a public state, he was, you know, during, I don't know the festival day, maybe Gorpanim, something like that, he came, and he was describing how he'd known Prabhupada as a young man, because Prabhupada traveled so all over these places. Then, 1965, he's going about his business in the temple. He sees an old Babaji in the corner, and he's crying. He's chanting and crying. So naturally, he comes over and says, and he looks, and he sees that it was a Bai Babu, Srila Prabhupada, who's now taken sannyas, Bhaktivedanta Swami. So you know how you, you haven't seen somebody, he says, Abai Babu? Prabhupada says, yes. He says, why are you crying? He said, I am the, here's exactly what he said, I'm the unworthy disciple of Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur, and he has given me an impossible mission. And Prabhupada knew, he th I'm probably going to die on the boat, but if not now, when? I've got to try. So next, just to catch Prabhupada, what Prabhupada gave up, and what was Prabhupada's mood? This is the, he said, my Guru Maharaj has given me an impossible mission. The same thing, Prabhupada then went to, this is the Samadhi of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur in Mayapur. It's beautiful. And um, so Prabhupada also went there and was sweeping and crying. And the Pujari who also knew Prabhupada said, why? And he said, my Guru Maharaj, our Guru Maharaj has told me to go to the West. It's an impossible mission. Next. So it's described, Prabhupada said, there's that Bengali kirtan leader who went with Prabhupada when Prabhupada got on the boat. Also some family members, there were some other, but they saw Prabhupada getting on the boat alone. They said, he's a lone fighter, all by himself. Next. Of course, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Rupa Goswami, that's another thing. Prabhupada was on a morning walk. This is the Victoria Memorial in Calcutta. It was built, I think, the 50th, the Diamond Jubilee for Queen Victoria. It's meant to be a riff on the Taj Mahal. Um, it's a huge building. It, what is, does it say there? It's 15 stories tall. When they were building it, you know, there's scaffolding. And in India, and so many places in the developing world, the scaffolding is made out of that big bamboo. You, know, you lash it together. And that stuff sways in the wind. It creaks. You see them using it in Mayapur. You know, that's spooky stuff. They're, and it's all bamboo slats walking up it. Prophet is a young boy. Told that Prabhupada's on a morning walk, current time, you know, when Prabhupada was in Calcutta, about 75, 1975, he's walking with a bunch of devotees. You can hear it on the tape. Prabhupada stops. Someone asked Prabhupada, what's, what is this building? Prabhupada describes 
Then Prabhupada adds, he said, when I was a young boy, he doesn't give his age. He says, of course, we could calculate it, but I'll do that some other time. So say he was about 10 years old. Prabhupada climbed the scaffolding, creaking, swaying, you know, ee, all the way, whatever, 15 stories to the top. So they said, Prabhupada, you must have been very brave. And you can hear on the tape, Prabhupada says, and I am still brave. Otherwise, how have I come to your country all alone? Next. So 69 years old, all alone, 38 days at the sea, two heart attacks. All he had was a suitcase, an umbrella, because you use it for rainy weather and you use it for the hot sun in India. It's handy to have an umbrella. Uh, a supply of dry cereal. He had some oats. He had some dry things he could cook. Several trunks of books and 40 rupees, which, by the way, the banks in America would not even accept. You couldn't even convert it. So he had nothing. What he had was, the, anyway, the whole story. Um, 12,500 miles by sea. Next. Anybody ever been on, ever, anybody ever get seasick? How do you, how is it? It is hard. I've been seasick. I mean, it's just totally, you can just lie down. You got a headache, you're vomiting, you can't stand up. It's horrible. Prabhupada had seasick for how many days? In his, in his, huh? In his diary, that little Jaladutta diary, it just says disaster. And there's blank pages. I don't know how many, there's three or four or five blank pages. He couldn't even write. Okay, next. But then, oh, I'm sorry. So here it is in Prabhupada said, Krishna took charge of the boat. You all know the story, you know. He finally made some kitchri for John Mastami for the, had distributed a little feast of kitchri and savories. Next. This is Prabhupada in Boston Harbor. Prabhupada standing on the deck of the Jaladuta, you know, looking at, Boston skyline. He's arrived and he's just coming, stepping into Maya's kingdom in America. You know, and he sees the sign for lobster soup, you know, all this Robert describes, you know. And he's thinking, ah, if they know what I'm going to say, they're going to send me back. I, you know, the Lord Brockway, who is it? Lord, whatever, when they told him, follow forward we get the principles, can you make me a Brahmin? Certainly, just follow these principles. Impossible. So Prabhupada's seeing it in front of him, liquor shops and prostitutes. You know, it's a seedy area by the docks. So Prabhupada says, and everyone told him, you got to wear Western dress. You're going to have to feed them meat. You got to learn to eat with a knife and fork. You can't tell them Krishna's God and he's blue and plays a flute. They'll, you know, it'll never work. So he's heard all of that. So he was praying intensely. You know the, the song, there's that poem. But Prabhupada, while he was praying, Balaram read part of it yesterday. Prabhupada says he was standing on the deck and saying, do I water it down? Do I, what do I do? How do I penetrate these people? And Prabhupada said the fog cleared and there was a warehouse and it had a big sign on it, unalloyed steel. Prabhupada said, okay, because he's great. Give me a sign, Krishna. Shh, fog clears, there's a big sign, unalloyed. Just give it to him as it is. Don't water it down, unalloyed steel. Next. This is the, um, uh, Immigration, you know, as so many, you know, immigrants from who knows when, you know, for 200 years, 100 years to be more accurate, they've come through this building. This is the building Prabhupada came through, got his passport stamped, and first stepped on American soul. And he wrote this, I'm a very unfortunate, unqualified, and the most fortunate. Therefore, I'm seeking your benediction so that I convince them, for I am powerless to do so on my own. Next. This is Butler, Pennsylvania in 1965. I found a photo. I mean, just imagine. This is, you know, walking down with saffron and his cane and his umbrella. It's like seeing a genie pop out of a bottle. And here's Sally Agarwal. I mean, that's, it's, it's a drawing I found. It's not actually Sally Agarwal, but she did have blonde hair. She was a young householder. And Prabhu would come over to bathe because he was staying at the YMCA where there was no bathroom and to wash his clothes and to cook. And she would pull pot roast out of the oven, flap her apron. Sorry, Swami, sorry, try to air out the kitchen. Um, there it is. This is where Prabhupada arrived. Next. These are some scenes from Butler. Butler is the home of the Jeep. They have a big factory there. That I don't know what Chevrolet or Ford, you know. And this was America. I mean, it was just America ruled the world. We'd just come out of World War II. 
America was really the only superpower. I mean, if, if, if you weren't white, Protestant, male, you just didn't even fit in the scene. Just, you know, you were, if you were Jewish, forget it. If you were Catholic, well, you were on the border, but we're still a little suspicious about you. John Kennedy running for president. It was a real difficult, he had to promise he wouldn't follow the Pope. They were suspicious. So just imagine apple pie, America, the prophet says, oh, no meat eating, no illicit sex, no intoxication. God's not an old man with a beard. <laughs> you know? What? Next. So this is Prophet's daily route. You know, he would walk to Dr. Mishra's house. Prophet did not like cold. As Giriraj Maharaj is keenly intelligent, his father was keenly and he, Prabhupada liked his father and he liked Prabhupada. And he was his, I don't know it was the first time, second time, but one of the early times he was, Giriraj Maharaj's father was meeting Prabhupada. He was asking Prabhupada about Prabhupada's travel. And Giriraj Maharaj's father figured it out. He said, oh, so when it's hot in India, you're in the temperate West. And when it gets cold in the West, you're in India. Prabhupada said, you have understood my psychology. They asked Prabhupada, is there a hell in your theology? Prabhupada said, <laughs> anyway, Mukundamarsh told me, Prabhupada said that for you, what did he say? You say heaven is hell. Uh, I mean, hell is hot. For me, I say hell is cold. He did not like cold weather. Any gentleman, everything's dead. Who likes cold, you know, freezing snow? Send me a postcard. I'm not going. So, but this is Prabhupada's morning. Look at Prabhupada. He's got this coat on. He's got long johns on. He's got some, somebody gave him some waterproof shoes. And he's every day, you know, the cook, because there was a kitchen there. And, you know, and to preach to Dr. Misha. This is where Prabhupada walked. Can you imagine? What did Prabhupada go through for us? That's my point. He gave up Vrindavan, came on that boat, slogged through the snow. Next. Now he's getting a little traction. This is, they've moved. This is, they've moved it anyway. But these are the early days. There's a phone booth. Who even has phone booths there? That's the first temple. Abai Charande, fearless at the Lord's lotus feet. Next. These are the first American Vaishnav. It's, it's getting traction. Amazingly enough, in the middle of what dogs run free, so why can't we? That was the slogan. I remember being around. Dogs run free, so why can't we? Well, maybe you're not a dog, and maybe a dog is suffering, you know? Okay, next. We're almost done. So here's Prophets at, uh, in front of St. Bridget's. In Tom is this Tompkins Square Park or is this Washington Park? I forget which one. Huh? Is it Tompkins? Yeah. And there's a plaque now on that tree or next to the tree, there's a plaque by the city of um, New York saying this is a historical spot. It describes how the Hare Krishna movement started here about Srila Prabhupada, right there. So next. This is Prabhupada on the other coast. Uh, yeah, Hippie Hill. I think that's Hayagriva right behind Prabhupada with the big beard. That's Dayananda and his wife. And you can just see a little slip. That's Mukundamarsh playing a kettle drum. He used to take a kettle drum out. So there it is. Prabhupada, they asked Prabhupada, um, Sridhar Swami, Prabhupada's good friend, Sridhar Maharaj, they asked Prabhupada, I, he was describing Prabhupada's unique accomplishments. And he said the reason Prabhupada was successful, I mean, there's many reasons, but he selected core reasons. He said because Prabhupada had boundless compassion. He said we could not do it. We could not mix with these people. But Prabhupada had boundless compassion and unflinching faith in the holy name. Just get them to chant the holy name and the holy name, a Papa Vidyam, it will do its business. Next. We're almost done. So just imagine this scene. You saw Prabhupada there sweeping and crying in front of Radha Damodar Temple, in front of Rupa Goswami Samadhi. How will these people ever become Krishna conscious? It's impossible. Lord Brockway, a sophisticated gentleman in Oxford Don, told Prabhupada, it's impossible. He was the governor of Bengal for a number of years. And he said it was impossible. How are these, you know, they don't even know to wash after passing stool, sticking their fingers in their mouth, up their nose, who near, believing who knows what. Savages. It's like going to Crow Magnon, man. So, but here he is. Here's the end of the circle. 
He's come back with Western disciples and he's offering them to Rupa Goswami. It worked. By your mercy, it worked. Next. So Prabhupada said, this is the first, this is the Jayananda built the cards. This is the first Ratha Yatra. You have to remember Prabhupada wandering. Sometimes Prabhupada would just go to the library to see if he managed to get in, in, in New York City Library, one of the best libraries in the world, Prabhupada managed to get the Bhagavatam in there. And he used to go and just see if people, he had a couple sets he got, he got in the New York Library. And he would just go some bite. And it, it's noted in his diary, a couple bus transfers, you know, on his way to see when the next ship was leaving for India. Because he really was having, you know, he was not happy living in America. But he would go past the New York City Library and see if anyone was checking out the Bhagavatam. And he was pleased. They, he could see on the card that the Bhagavatams were being checked out, you know. So imagine that. Living in the Bowery. Prabhupada said that drunks would be lying on the street and the, uh, lying on the stairs. Prabhupada's walking down the sidewalk. He's got to walk up to his, bis up to his apartment, his, you know, in his loft with a cat. You know, the Carl and what's his name had a cat with a cat food next to Prabhupada's food. He has, you know, ingredients in the fridge. So Prabhupada would be walking and the drunks would be passed out prone on the steps. Prabhupada says, but they were respectful. One drunk would say to the other, here comes Swami. Prabhupada said they would roll out of the way. And then Prabhupada would walk up the steps and they'd roll back, you know. Prabhupada says in this way they were offering dandavats. <laughs> I mean, only Prabhupada would see it like that. So, but here we are full circle. Okay, next, and this, I think this is the last one. Just for fun, this is the LA Ratha Yatra. From nothing. Thousands and thousands of people. Next. So, we'll end here, but we should consider all, consider what Prabhupada gave up, Vrindavan in the highest ecstasy, consider what he struggled through, the boat, living in New York all alone with nothing dealing with crazy people. That guy who went after him with a knife on LSD, tried to attack, Prabhupada had to run out on the street, call Makunda, please save me. So we should have that attitude of gratitude. We've received so much mercy. Prabhupada said, we'll end here. Madhavisa said to Prabhupada, it says in the Bhagavatam that in order to take the devotional service, one's reactions to sinful activities has to be completely eradicated. And you have to have a stock of pious deeds. No more pop, no more sin, and a pile of punya, pious deeds. Then you can take the devotional service. Madhuvisa said, Prabhupada, I was sinning till the day I met you. He had a McDonald's before he went to see Prabhupada for the first time. He said, how have I taken the devotional service? Anyone know Prabhupada's answer? Prabhupada said, I have created your good fortune. I heard Prabhupada say this. It's like if you're walking down the street. This was in, he was reading from Chaitanya Charitamrita in Detroit, 1976. It's like if you're walking down the street and somebody just comes up and push, pushes you, gives you, shoves on you stacks of, of thousand dollar bills or a big, you know, bag of gold, just gives it to you. You have no qualification. You have no desire. The person you don't know, and they just gave it to you. Prabhupada said, that's causeless mercy. So I've created your good fortune. However, that good fortune did not come out, come without a price, without an expectation. We had no hope. Prabhupada created our good fortune, but he had an expectation. Anyone know what that expectation was? Prabhupada told Madhavisa, all I, I've created your good fortune. All I ask is you go and create good fortune for others. We've been delivered. Prabhupada gave a devotee named Patit Udaran, which means fallen deliver, fallen deliverer. We are fallen and yet we're being delivered. So as we've received it, that attitude of gratitude, we should give it to others and we can end there. All glorious, with time, I'm really. That a good point. Thank you very much. This is Prabhupada in Vaikuntha. I mean, I mean Vaikuntha. <laughs> this is Prabhupada, he was beyond Vaikuntha. This is Prabhupada in Golden Gate Park. I'm sorry, Balboa Park. It's Prabhupada in Balboa Park. Yeah, Prabhupada, some, Prabhupada walked in Balboa Park. The devotee said to Prabhupada, Prabhupada, it's just like Vrindavan. Prabhupada said, no, it is like Dwarka. We'll end there. You look at those big palatial buildings. Thank you, Prabhus. All glories to